Then we'll talk about it. I, I just want the map. I know. I actually ended up all the things. Uh, I did it backwards. I, you're very thoughtful. Um, wait, 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 I can see we pray on here. Very good. I don't trust people. I don't trust all the events. Just throwing that out. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's not done. I just found a box of like 300 vapor clips. So I'm going to go to town with vapor clips. Wait till you guys see this. All right. So tomorrow we're going to watch Killing Fields. Which is an incredible documentary out on World War One, and I like it for a lot of reasons, and so you will like it. But we do that tomorrow, and that's on the front page of that packet. But guess what's on the back page of that packet? Want to take a guess? A wild guess? The Espionage Act. So the Espionage Act is on there. I'm sitting here. And so. See, it says espionage act, and we need what? Well, you don't need to have, but you have to have this done for Wednesday. For Wednesday. And I left spaces for you to write on this, or you can write on this, but it has to be sentences. Therefore, it must be in what? And in what color pen? Only black. Black pen. Blue or black, please. We'll turn that in. It That is a law, and... Kind of amazing law called the Espionage Act. So that'll be due on Wednesday. So let's go ahead and take your notes down. Let's get to that. We got to get to winding the war. Oh, what battle happened that would convince the Germans to just crazily, I mean, it's, it's food. Looking back at it, of course, hindsight's a beautiful thing. What battle, what battle kept Germany in the war? What battle did Britain and France say, hey, we could win this war and stop German aggression? Far. Oh, what was the big cannon? Big birthday. Big birthday. I've ever remembered big birthday. Or birthday. And so I went through the battle, went through everything that happened. Oh, we did the plan for little Belgium. So let's get to widening the war. Talk about trenches. I like that little scene I showed you. Let's get right to here. So widening the war. So what happened is in 1914, once they devolved into stale. Once it devolved into that. Kind of race to the sea. Both sides begin to look for ways to try to hit the enemy in some place. Weaker or other countries jumped in. For example, Germany had colonies all over the world. So Britain, especially Britain, but also France, began to attack them. Or what would happen a lot would be like colonists in the British colony of South Africa attacked the German their militia attacked the German colony of Southwest Africa, which is today Namibia. The colony of Australia attacked the German colony of, I swear to you, I'm not making this name up, Kaiser Wilhelm Land in what is now New Guinea. And there be, so it's going to rage all over the world, overnight. In fact, in German East Africa, which is now Tanzania, the Germans held out until 1919. They didn't know the war was over. They kept fighting. And, but then Japan joined the Allies. Japan was a Brit ally of the British. They saw this as a way to not only scoop up more land in China, scoop up islands in the Pacific that Germany owned. Germany had a bunch of islands in this area right here. But China, the, uh, Jap uh, the 
the Germans had a city called Tinjau that the uh, kind of colonized that city. So Japan attacked that. And some of these, some of these islands, Japan would get out through the war. And these islands would become infamous in another war that's coming up. Islands like Truk or, or Kwajalein or any we talk. Or a place called Saipan or Tini. You might have heard of these islands. And then, so the war is widening that way. I should add, Japan would be very disappointed by the treaty that ended the war. They felt like they were robbed. I'm sure that will make an impact down the road. Moving on, the Ottoman Empire jumped in. Both sides tried to convince the Ottomans to join. They were weak. They were called the sick man of Europe. But the Central Powers promised them a lot of territory, especially the stands. This region of the Russian Empire right there. Uh, majority Sunni Muslims and the Ottomans thought that they were, were distant relatives and therefore they could become part of the empire. And thus blocking the Black Sea now for uh, ships, allied ships go to Russia. That would become huge. Next, going in 1915, further efforts to widen the war. <laughs> Everybody started promising Italy everything. All these secret negotiations. And finally, Italy joined the Allies. They promised them this finger of land right here called the Tyrol, northern Italy. In fact, if you go there today, it's really interesting. You drive through, if you're in Italy, everything's in Italian. All of a sudden, you cross into the Tyrol, and all the signs are both in Italy and Germany, Italian and Germany. That legacy of being part of the Austrian Empire. But they also promised them land here, islands off of Turkey. They promised Italy all this stuff. Italy would not get most of it. That would trigger all the plot to resentment in Italy. I'm sure nothing big is going to happen in Italy in the 1920s. Nothing called fascism or anything. Moving on. Bulgaria would join the Central Powers too. They were promised land in Serbia and land from Greece. And that would be 1915. Now, other places would join in, like eventually China would join in at the end of 1917, and other places would join up. 1917, or 1917, the United States would join. Romania would join, rather foolishly, join the Allies in 1916. But these are the biggies we have to get right here. But the point is, everyone's trying to attack each other on the periphery, find some place they're vulnerable. All this really did is made the war bigger and more horrible. So 1915, German strategy, and this is their basic strategy for the war. After Tannenberg, also the Masurian Lakes, but Tannenberg's the big one. They decided, let's just hold in the West, dig deep. They took the high ground. So any enemy attack has got to come uphill. Great advantage. They could pick where they defend, hold out the areas of France they could hold out. It's the most industrialized region. Hold it. And then not rush out. They thought they could knock Russia out, win in the east, and then we'll see. But force Russia out. And then also, remember Serbia? They would send about 150,000 troops and help the Austrians to destroy Serbia. They, they devastated Serbia. Now, the Western ally, or the Allies, a little more complex. Britain didn't have an army. They literally had to create an army, all volunteer army, and they got millions of volunteers. So they got this big rush of volunteers, and then they really started heavily recruiting 18 year olds. And so they would go in secondary schools or neighborhoods where most of the kids were working, most of the young people were working by them, and they would go to young people in big rallies, the big parades and rallies, and it was join with your pals. They called them pals regiments. But the idea being is all these young men in one neighborhood would join together. And nobody would want to be the one guy who didn't volunteer because they, their friends would look down on them. They might look like a coward. And so they'd all join together. It's actually a pretty good way to recruit. Them. And it's horrific for them. Think about it that they call them pals regiments. They talk about going to the three times. If that regiment is let's say the first one over the top who attacked the German lines, and that regiment is slaughtered, 
What's that mean for that never value of the R? It's just going to have this would be all these this no young men coming back in one neighborhood. And it's going to be it's going to lead to this weird thing where you have a neighborhood where these pals regiments, those regiments, they didn't take that many casualties. And they just literally the next block over in places like London or Manchester or Birmingham. Another neighborhood, there's no young men, just none. In the 1920s, that was just a hole in the generational hole. But they won't be ready until 1916. So they lied, and the French especially lied to their people. The government lied and said, we're going to defeat them in 1915. And they did some offenses, but they knew they would not be able to do it until Britain had an army in 1916. You'll find out something in war. The truth dies. Really fast. All governments lie and lie all the time. And one important thing about that is, you can imagine those would be dictators will figure that out. If I can keep my country in a state of constant war, I can justify being dishonest as a measure of war. There's reasons why Russia's remaining in this war, even though they clearly are, did not get the, what they wanted. It allows them to, the government to have more control. In a horrific way. We'll come back to it. Next, so sniffing up the blockade. And so the naval blockade, Germany, the idea would be to slowly starve them out. Germany got almost all the fertilizer from the Americans. And so the idea they can't get the fertilizer, they stop. But this takes a while. So this is slow. So they're telling the people, we're going to end the war. We'll be home by Christmas, that kind of thing. But no. And then they, Russia needed weapons. Russia had to create their own arms industry from, from just the tiny little bit that was there. And they had to figure out ways to get supplies. They're going to become desperate to try to get the breakthrough. Can anyone see this right here? Breakthrough right here. This is called Gallipoli, the Dardanelles, and get a route to get supplies up in the box. That would become a desperation. And Russia's been wanting this forever. So it's kind of part of the deal. Russia, you might get it. In fact, Russia almost invaded, they had it all planned, and then things kind of broke down. It's one of those what ifs in history. So the Allies might come in the other way. And then attack in the periphery, find some soft spot, pick and throw, weaken them in some way. So for 1916, they can knock them out. But also, they got to have, they needed victories. You have to have victories. They keep the people going. They need victories. Remember 1864. Lincoln needed to win, or Lincoln needed a victory to win. That's why Atlanta and Mobile had to fall. Even though the war was still going on, just had to give the people a feeling it's worth it. We're going to win. So the conflict is going to devolve down into fronts, various fronts. So before the armies weren't big enough to control vast amounts of areas, so much like the Civil War, you have men in camps, so they would go maneuver, they find a battle, maybe go back to camp, maybe continue to fight. But now you have mass armies where they could literally have trenches and defend it all the way from Switzerland to the North Sea. This area is rougher, more mountainous, so they didn't need that many men here, but almost all the fighting would be right in here. So you're going to have a Western Front. This would try to be the most important for lots of reasons. The Russian Front. Sometimes you might say it called the Eastern Front, but there's more. And no, you don't need to know all these, but it's just amazing what happened. Italian Front, Balkan Front, Romanian Front, Palestinian Front, Caucasus Front, Mesopotamian Front. Do you get the point? Lots of fronts. Also, I should add, so all you need to know really is the Western Front and the Russian Front, but there'll be a new one too. Brand new in war. We can see the elements with the march to the sea. Something called a home. That is new. And that is more horrible than ever before. New war. It's important if you're going to not only plan an attack, to know the weather. So not only just the plan of attack, you need to know the weather. You don't want to attack when a storm is coming. But as airplanes became more important, and also sea travel, meteorology became a new science. A very, as we all know, inexact science. Check the weather, but becoming very important. And meteorology was actually developed 
this development before became crucial during the war. And so the war is going on, meteorology is just developing. And so they took a lot of terms from the war and brought it to meteorology. So for example, let's say a cold front moves into a hot warm front and that line between the two, what do they start calling that? You ever heard there's a cold front coming in or a warm front? That comes from no for what? Makes sense, doesn't it? We just had a cold front come in yesterday. We can also have the wind day. We have the snowstorm. Warm front's going to come in at the end of the week. Cold front, it's going to be like in the 90s by next week. So, but I figured that out. Actually, uh, weather's really weird. There's a cold front going through Oklahoma. So they had tornadoes all day yesterday, all across the state. Weird weather is now normal weather. And so, on the Russia front, let's get to this. One massive battle happened in Australia. It's two little towns there called Tarno. It's called Tarno and Gorlitz. They're right here. The Russians tried an offensive, a combined German and Austrian counterattack, outflanked them, and destroyed an entire Russian army. And even though Tannenberg, because of its importance to the war, you know, that would change into the world's history. Might be more important. Tarno and Garlis was actually more decisive. The Russians would actually have to pull all the way back to this line right here. We're talking thousands of square miles. A massive defeat. They still have a little bit of Austrian land, which is now Ukraine. But all this land, all of Poland, Russian Poland, they had to give up. And the Germans would create a, a puppet state called Poland. And lots of Lithuania, big hunks of Ukraine, and what, what we call Belarus, Belarus today. And a massive defeat. The only reason the Germans didn't take more is they didn't have enough men to hold it. Russia was defeated. By all rights, Russia should have quit. They didn't. They stayed in the fight. Food shortages are going to hit. Soon, food riots. Some of you, if you've looked ahead in history, you know what's going to happen. Two revolutions for the price of one. And then the Italians open up. And this front, this finger of land right here, the Italians attacked into. But the problem is, it's in the Julian Alps. Some of the peaks are 14,000 feet tall. That's bigger than any mountain in Montana. That's bigger than Mount Helen. And massive valleys. One of the reasons why the Julian Alps is so famous today is one of the most beautiful mountains in the mountain ranges of the world. Because it has these river valleys. And so you have thousands of big peaks that go down about speed to a valley, then up another peak. I guess these valleys are just stunningly beautiful. I've only seen little edges of the Julian Alps. I'd really like to go. Like, a little more time. Everyone says it's just amazing. My sister in law, who lives in Berlin, it's a year ago, spent like three weeks there. I'm just heard all about it. I was very jealous. <laughs> but they're fighting at 14,000 feet. Just unbelievable fight. In fact, just two years ago, they found a whole bunch of Italian bodies. They were killed and then covered up with snow. Either they didn't have time to bury them or something like that. When the bodies were frozen and perfectly intact, mummified, frozen, solid, and then kind of mummified in there. I mean, they, they it was like they were just asleep. Except they're very gray. But horrific fight. And the Italians took massive casualties, but stalemate. Stalemate together. Then the Ottomans. Everybody thought the Ottomans would fall apart. Everybody. In fact, the Germans were happy to get them, but they were really worried. They sent some weapons, but the Germany was stretched pretty thin. You know, they're fighting this massive war basically alone. And all these areas, the Ottomans had conquered this massive group of Arabs here who had been shaping against Ottoman rule for hundreds of years. They didn't like to be under the command of them. The bigger countries like Egypt had already kind of broken away. Then British, the British scooped them up. So you, you do not need to know this. You do not. I just put down three fronts. It's kind of amazing. There's a Palestinian front, the Mesopotamian front, and the Caucasus fronts. 
I should add the Caucasus front, the right, the Turks invaded into the Caucasus Mountains, another really high mountain chain. But then they were beaten, and the Russians invaded a little bit in the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottomans went crazy. Just crazy. We'll come back to that. But one you do need to know is British convinced Arabs, starting here, but hopefully all the way up here, that, um, to revolt against the Ottomans with the promise they would be independent. And their capital city would be Damascus, right there. So they promised independence and they rose up at the end of 1915 and 1916, 1917, and, and did guerrilla warfare, some, sometimes quite effectively against the Ottomans and joined into the, the mostly British attack. But they thought they were going to win independence. Yeah. And the British were lying through their teeth. The British also promised this land to a growing movement called Zionism for Jews to find a homeland. They promised them vague land here, but then the British and French just planned on keeping it. This is what we call uh, one of these uh, things that we like to change the world. I present so funny. And they'll create a bunch of places called Palestine, Jordan, Syria, Iraq. The implications to this day. Yes, the British were lying through their teeth. And then one more thing. Right here is Gallipoli. They try to break their way in to help the Russians. They thought an attack on the periphery, periphery. Can't say the word. The British, with some French help, decided to attack right here, Gallipoli. Now they like these kind of terrain maps. These are really popular. So here's the Dardanelles Peninsula. This is Gallipoli. And you sail up this strait, Constantinople's right here in the Black Sea. They can get up into. They try to run up with their ships. It almost worked, but they failed underwater mines, and so they attacked here. And for eleven months, British, French, but also colonial forces from Australia and New Zealand got bogged down in Gallipoli, and this turned into a humiliating defeat for the Allies. So humiliating that all these Australian and, New Z Australian and New Zealand forces who arrived there, they took so many casualties that a couple of things happened. First off, they vowed never again to trust the British. Secondly, this created Australia. Australia was separate little colonies and territories. This unified them in anger over the slaughter Australian forces took at Gallipoli. If you go to Gallipoli today, and it's they have these massive tours, it's all Australians. They make the pilgrimage to go see where their fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers fought. To this day, Gallipoli is like the founding moment of Australia. Horrific fighting. There's a very good movie about this that Australians made. It's probably made the most popular movie in Australian history called, with Thorpe, Gallipoli. It has this Australian actor. Kind of made a name for himself, named Mel Gibson. That was his first big movie. Second big thing. I can't stand. I can't stand Mel Gibson. I like a little. For me. All right, good. So let's get back to the Western Front. It's still. They try all these things. They can't break through. There's going to be a couple big French offenses in 1915. Those are French soldiers, but neither side could break. So they started looking at. Part of the reason why was stalemate so bad and ways to break it? Well, as we know, trench warfare. Both sides dug in. Trenches old. Trenches are as old as warfare. But now with our spotted artillery and machine guns, they had no choice but to dig in. Now this area would be called no man's land. This is a little easier to see schematic, but that's the real thing. Taken from an observation balloon at about ten thousand feet. I can't think of anything more miserable, miserable than being on a balloon at 10,000 feet. It's not pressurized, it's cold, it's free. It'd be pretty awful. And they're hydrogen balloons. So when they were shot down, I think you get the idea. They did rig up parachutes. They're basically just blankets. Volunteers for that one. They kind of did it on the fly. Here's no man's land. And you can see first line communication trenches. And so on and so on, the artillery in the rear. And you notice trenches are not straight, they're jagged. 
Jagged allows you to put more men in, but also, let's say if a shell hits right here, it'll only affect that one area. The shrapnel won't go down through. So all the trenches are jagged. And I just, what I wanted for Ukraine is devolving. The Russians have these trench building machines that are doing trenches like this. They know the Ukrainians are going to do a counterattack to rise up and bend. And so it's just like World War One, just so surreal. All the weapons have changed and still fighting the same way. At each of these points, there'd be a machine gun, artillery be trained on here. At night, there'd be patrols. They put up millions of feet of barbed wire in between. The funnel men into killing zones. It was hell on earth, but it's better to be inside a trench than not. Now, remember, I told you the Germans were going to hold out. If you look at that line right there, which one do you suppose is the German trench and which one's the Allies? If you look at that spot of trench right there, which one's German? Does it make sense? This is German. Does it look more organized? The Allies knew they had to get out of the trenches and drive them back. So they, just they were not as careful and precise digging their trenches. Part of it was they wanted to make them more miserable so the men would get out and fight, which made the morale that much worse. This would become for well, all the fronts in some way. Sometimes this would be 100 yards. Like in south, though, in southern France, this would be a quarter mile. They, they didn't fight much. That would be the, they would rotate, both sides would rotate. And it was usually a week in a rough area, a week in a quiet area for people to try to rotate if they could. I should add, World War II, neither side could do it. The men suffered even more, ironically. So with that, just a couple of shots of trenches. There is a British trench that had been taken and recaptured, and you can see the bodies. And a lot of times they would dig and find bodies that were hastily dug. I think you can imagine how horrible it was. And here are German soldiers about ready to go over the top and leave. This is an American soldier about ready to go over the top. They should put Occupy French or British French. They would just take over. Remember I told you that I talked about at Petersburg, they stick a hat up. Here is an Australian soldier putting up a pith helmet. These are kind of like jungle warm weather helmets. They do the same thing to guess how many bullet rounds would go through and gamble. A couple more things, the joys of trench life. Here are German soldiers picking lice eggs out of the uniform. They go in the trench covered with lice, just uncomfortable misery. You can kill, the lice you can wash off, but the eggs, they stick to the air. Anyone go through, we got the occasional elementary school with lice scares. Anybody go through one of those? A few people did, ah, oh, fun. We, have, we haven't had one in high school. I bet it's been 20 years, and I know what you're thinking. It's about time. If you've gone through one, they're pretty horrible. You've got to get that weird brush. And, yeah, it's awful. Back then, they would just use cigarettes and go, Shh. Okay. Here, so in Belgium, they had clay soil, so the water, it kind of held the water. But more importantly, the water table is so high there that when they would dig 12-foot trenches, they might be right to the water table, and all it took is one rain, and the water table would go up a foot, and now you're in a ditch, a, a, a canal. And think about it, your feet are in that for three or four weeks. So we all know our skin wrinkles, right? We go in the bathtub. And that's because the water comes in, you know, the skin's very porous, blood can't circulate, and that's your body's defense, it speeds out so it can protect itself from that. But essentially, your capillaries are drowning. So you drive it, the blood circulates, you're fine. But if the blood isn't circulates, circulates, it can't battle invaders. Well, there's fungus in soil, all this fungus everywhere. And if the fungus can, in the water can grab hold of that skin that is all wrinkled up and your blood can't fight against it, the fungus takes hold, the fungus really bites it, but it bites to eat and begins to take over. And soon your feet begin to hurt. It's called trench foot. And there's stories about people taking their socks off afterwards and taking toes off. You can't fight like that. I should add, it hurts. It's not like, oh, <laughs> my toes fell off. <laughs> no, it hurts really bad. 
If you know anything about the military today, if you're in the Army or the Marines, for example, what, the number one prop thing that will get you disciplined, wet feet. Wet feet mean trench foot. I think you're gonna understand why, but how do you escape it if you're in a trench? Oh, here are some French soldiers, but they all did it on a rat fighting expedition. Look at that thing. That's bigger than a poodle. You could just imagine the rats. I mean, just everywhere, and they'd snuggle in, nibble on you, and eating all the bodies. Because it would be human and horse, especially, everywhere. So they try a few things. Oh, that's in Belgium. And that's a picture I took. And that's actually near where both Adolf Hitler and future Prime Minister Winston Churchill are from. These weird, strange little quirks of history. That's a tunnel. Remember I told you about the Battle of the Crater where they blew up the Confederate line? They did it here, too. There's a low mountain in Belgium where the Germans blew half the mountain up trying to attack it. The Allies did the same thing about a, a mile down. They had tunnel fights. When people in the tunnel, they called tunnel rats, would fight each other. You could go into these tunnels and really like bats in cramped conditions. I, can't, I couldn't hardly look into it. It just looked scary. Bats, I'm not a fan of bats. I know bats are important. But they're flying rats, and I don't trust them. But as you can see, this beautiful mountain valley, all it would take is. Back! Danger! So here are American soldiers about ready to go over the top scene and fixing their bayonets, even though they rarely ever got close enough to use their bayonets. They would so drill for it, but they, you know, they shoot. Here are British soldiers going over the top. And I just showed you this picture because I just find it so amusing. You know, they're, they got all geared up. They're absolutely terrified. They go over the top. Machine guns are blazing. And see what he's doing? See what he's doing? He's insulting them. He's giving them a nod, a gesture. He's going like this. Yeah, take that, Germans. Okay, that just makes me laugh. So, some of the weapons they would use that would make the stalemate worse, and they never did break it. <laughs> Machine guns are too heavy, especially then, to move, and so they're purely a defensive weapon. But machine guns line up at strategic points to just mow down the towers. They wouldn't aim, they just have a small arc. They just go back and forth with this firing as many bullets as they can. This about 400 rounds are missing. It's water cool to the little hose. And then down about 100 yards after the man's a little hard. You just put as many bullets out to anybody in that, trying to climb over the barbed wire or go through the shell holes would be attacked. This is an American soldier with a French machine gun, a Lewis gun. Those are uh, Italian soldiers with machine gun. So machine guns are too heavy to really move. They're a defensive weapon. I should add that the men hated machine gunners. The only people they hated worse than machine gunners were snipers. Snipers and machine gunners were almost never taken prisoner. Do you get my point on that? They might surrender. They didn't care. Because they hated them. Especially when they would fire their machine gunners so they, their enemy might surround them on the attack and then surrender. No. So, here's a few weapons to try to. Okay, I just found this kind of amusing. The fight with the machine gun. Look at this shield thing that Germans did. That was like that little personal little thing I showed you on Friday. You go across no man's land. Here, this was mining a dog. You put a dog, some explosives on a dog, and have it run into the trenches and then blow up the dog. And they tried this. The, the Russians tried this in World War II. They used it to have dogs run under tanks and then blow up the tank. And uh, lots of dogs were killed in this. And yes, I don't want dogs. I mean, a lot of humans are dying, but like the dogs had a choice. Here's another one that be mining the rat. An explosive in a rat. I think it's supposed to be like a booby trap, but I just like the idea of throwing rats at each other. But and I thought I'd just show you this picture showing this still medieval. They still thought cavalry would be usable. 
And so, for example, in 1918, when the Germans were doing their last great offense, here are German cavalrymen, still with the lance, gas masks, the new helmets. Helmets were invented by the Germans in this war. Artillery, though, is the big killer. There is really heavy artillery. There's British on the left. Down below is, is a German soldier riding a very heavy shell, probably a 255 millimeter. I can find that thing you're using. Try to show it to you. Those are American soldiers driving up shells on the bottom right. They call that a mine thrower, the, the big, weird looking cannon, the weird wheels on the top. And it was a high one, so that bob shells at a high angle. Sometimes you might call it a mine mortar. I know what a lot of you are thinking, what, what the German helmets look like. Here is a German World War I helmet. This was actually taken off a battlefield in Italy in 1945 in World War II. So they were still using World War I era helmets. Still hot, heavy, and it's getting pretty old. Some of the felt they used around here. They did not wear this on their head, directly on their heads, they had a little cap. And every helmet today is based on the German. They're heavy. And it was not that heavy, but where for a few hours, your neck would be sold. It was not meant to stop a bullet, but it might help with each other. And they adopted these. The Americans would adopt the British helmet. I'll show you that a little bit later. Okay, I'm going to try to make it on the sad. This could be a carnival game. That's the real deal. But it's getting pretty old. It is getting really old. So a former teacher here about it, and then when you retired, he did. It was one of those things, yeah, it's great to have, and then really, what can you do with it? You know, <laughs> have it at home? I have a helmet. So the German World War II helmets look very similar. They're still slightly higher quality, so they're a little bit lighter. But they were so desperate by 1945, they were just using these things. I mean, it's pretty heavy, isn't it? That would not be comfortable. The Allied helmets weren't as good. Flamethrowers were just invented at this time, and shooting jelly gasoline. The big thing about that is you find a fixed defensive spot, you shoot jelly gasoline at it. It's not the point of hitting it. But like rational people are if flame is coming at you, what would you do? Run and at least die. So it keeps them from firing. But I think you can see the problem with flame trolls. The Germans invented it, the French. You're carrying a tank of jelly gasoline. If, if a bullet hits the can of jelly gasoline, I think we all know what's going to happen. Let's just say the attrition of these guys were pretty hot. A couple more things. We have tanks right here, and the British invented tanks. But they thought, we'll make a land battleship. So in 1950, they began work on this with these new, they have tracked tractors for farming to hide the name. They codenamed it water tanks. So it would hide the fact that they're actually a weapon. They're just like bringing supplies to the men. That's why they're called tanks today. Tanks is kind of meaningless, it doesn't make sense. We were all kind of used to we say tanks, we know what it means. But didn't then. They had these cough drop looking things where the first tanks they had, but not till 1917. They were slow, thinly armored, the exhaust didn't work. And so sometimes the men would die from monoxide poisoning. But by 1917, they would become decisive. The Germans didn't have the resources to make a lot of tanks. They made these monstrosities that were best known for breaking down. And they basically made about 20. It's just too expensive. But the first real modern tank would be the French. These are Americans using French Renault tanks at a turret. They were slow and lightly armored at the beginnings of a modern tank. It didn't turn the tide of the war here. But the potential, I think some of you, if you looked ahead in history, no World War II. One more weapon I'll show you right after the bell rings, and that is, of course, planes. Oh, I, I forgot to show you the Tsar tank. The Russians tried this massive armored big wheel thing. Look how massive this thing is. Here's a reproduction of it at a museum in Russia. Look, look at it compared to the armored car. I know what you're thinking. I want one too. 
That would be so awesome. It would have no real purpose except for the fact that it makes me laugh, so I had to show you. The last thing though, planes. And planes start out reconnaissance, but I think you get a camouflage. What do you think? Why is it you bought camouflage? Aerial reconnaissance. And then once reconnaissance, let's say a German and a French plane passed together in 1914, they would just salute each other. These are shorts. And then it dawned on somebody, well, we should start shooting at each other. Thus, the development of fiber planes to knock reconnaissance planes out. And I think you can see where that's going to go. What is due on Monday, AKA Wednesday? Yeah. <laughs> the espionage app. Yeah. So, tomorrow we'll watch the killing fields. Uh, we'll, we're kind of getting to total war. These are the Americans use a French fire that puts a SPAD 13. That's a Smithsonian Museum. That's a Southwood Camel, a British fighter. That's what Snoopy flew. You know anything about Snoopy versus the Red Baron? Speaking of the Red Baron, he flew this. It was a German plane that after Lord moved, the, the company moved to the Netherlands. It's in Fokker, so it's called the Fokker DR1. DR and then this is the Fokker D7. It's probably the best plane. Ever. But the Allies could build more. Do you notice where the machine gun is? The only place heavy enough to hold the machine gun is right over the engine. Do you see a problem at first? What would they shoot off? Their propeller. And that means you had to land very quickly. On that note, we'll see you tomorrow. Anybody want to wear the helmet? You never know how the hallways are. Oh, it's um, Helter Skelter. Oh, Manson. Uh, he thought it was like about like Brickstone. Uh, it's not really about Skelter. Welcome to the Titanic. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Much. Yeah. You have to be short ID, right? Oh, the month was your life. So out of it. Shut the camera off. So we're going to walk that killing feels that I told you.